So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and this evening we're going to be in verses 2 through 5. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. And if you wouldn't mind, when you find that standing with me to honor God and His Word this evening, we'll begin reading in verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. Now pay attention to this last sentence. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Gracious Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, we thank you for the worship that we have already engaged in, for the blessing of the Spirit, the blessing of that uh, special music that we've just heard, and how it uplifts our spirit. Now we just pray that you would draw us into your presence for instruction from the Word. We want to live to honor you, Lord. We want to worship you, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week, through Amen. living the Word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Chapter 6 here begins with instructions uh, for servants and masters, but then it seems to take this uh, sudden change. It, it changes gears, and then Paul begins exhortation to preaching and teaching sound doctrine, as opposed to what is not sound doctrine. And it could be that chapter 5 really ends at the teaching, which begins in chapter 6, and then this new section of te teaching begins with chapter 6 in that last sentence of verse 2. It's important to note here, and it's important for you to understand, that chapters and verses in the Bible were all added later to make it easier to memorize. And so chapter division and subject division, that is left up to the interpreter. And there are some men that believe uh, the end of verse 2, which says, these things teach and exhort, references the subject matter of the letter, the entire letter, up to this point. The subject matter of the entire letter. Some scholars believe that this little sentence here, when it says these things teach and exhort, that it preferences the, preferences, or, uh, the next subject that Paul is addressing and leads into his teaching on sound doctrine as opposed to unsound doctrine. Now the translators of the King James Version, they leave the sentence at the end of verse 2, while there, there are other translations, uh, modern day translations, such as the English Standard Version, they put the sentence at the beginning of verse 3, and that highlights their position, uh, their belief that the verse is the beginning of a new section. So, what does this matter? It matters none in the least due to the fact that the sentence is rightly applied to all the teaching in this letter, but is also uh, applied to the very next subject in the letter. Men of God, preachers of the gospel, should teach all good doctrine and all right things that Paul has already covered in this text. But I've highlighted this difference of opinion in order to make a clean break from what was taught at the beginning of chapter 6. In other words, listen, last week or two weeks ago, we discussed in some detail what the Bible has to say about servants and masters. But now, now we're going to take on an entirely new subject, and that is good doctrine. And the end of verse 2, that sentence... At the end of verse 2, it lends itself nicely to changing the direction. And so we could well paraphrase that sentence in this way. Moving on, I want you to teach and exhort these things. But just so there's no controversy here this evening, I stand in agreement with John R. W. Stott. And he writes about this. The bridge between the previous section of the letter and this new section is that apostles' terse announcement. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. Some translators regard this sentence as concluding the former section, while others see it as introducing the new one. It surely does both. But I went, all, I went through all that just to say that we are changing direction with the letter. And so we're moving on to verse 3, where we have Paul's teaching concerning false teachers. It says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, 
he is proud, knowing nothing. And now listen, this verse, it lets us know that there have been, there are now, there always will be men and women, people who try to make their way into the church seeking to teach other than what the Bible teaches. They do not consent to wholesome words. They will even teach things that are contrary to the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this phrase here, uh, and teach otherwise, as in, if any man teach otherwise, it's very descriptive in the Greek. It's one word that is a combination of uh, two different words. It is heterodidaskeo. And it means uh, to teach something different or otherwise, as he says in here, teach otherwise. But literally, the word means this, to teach doctrinal novelties. To teach doctrinal novelties. And so in the text, the Greek really reads this way, literally, if any man teaches doctrinal novelties, things that are not wholesome, things which run contrary to the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. If any man comes into the church teaching against doctrine, which is according to godliness, He's proud, etc., etc., etc. And the point I'm hoping to make is, listen, it should be known, it should be accepted by all believers in the church. There's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false teachers. There are going to be bad preachers in every age, and they're always going to try to infiltrate good churches. That's the devil's job. Amen. Amen. The Lord told us in Matthew chapter 24 that the days leading up to his return would be days of great spiritual deception. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. The Lord says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. The days leading up to the end. There are going to be days of deception. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, it says, little children, it is the last time, and you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. And then, the book of Jude, it tells us that these deceivers, these false prophets, these bad preachers, these Antichrists, they're going to try to infiltrate the church. Jude, verse 4, for there are certain men, listen, crept in, unaware. That is, they're creeps. Mm -hmm. They try to sneak into the church. And Jude says in verse 12, they are spots in your feast of charity, that is, they are blemishes upon your love feast, your fellowship, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. The only way that they can be a blemish on our fellowship meals is if they're right there taking, partaking in them. There's always going to be false prophets. There's always going to be false teachers. There are always going to be bad preachers in this age in the church. The thing is, the Bible teaches us how to plainly identify them. The Bible, in more than one section of Scripture, tells us what to look for when it comes to false teachers, uh, false prophets, and bad preachers. And, and what's more, listen, don't miss this. The Bible also tells us this. We don't have to put up with it. Not everybody who comes to the church is a child of God, folks. Not everybody who sits in the church pew on Sunday morning is saved and spirit-filled. If you, we had 105 people in worship this morning, and a group that large, you can just assume that there's going to be one or two or even 20 that don't know the Lord. Don't assume that everyone that comes to church is a child of God. Not everybody who sits with us in our Sunday school classes or takes part in our Bible study, they, they don't believe as we believe. And they don't hold a sound Bible doctrine. And, and it should be just received as a given in the church. Just mark it down. And I think that probably everybody here can uh, think of an example of someone who, who fits the profile that's being outlined by the Apostle Paul here at the end of the book of 1 Timothy. After I was first saved, uh, I was put in a Sunday school class that had a husband and wife as teachers. As a matter of fact, uh, it was through them that the Lord challenged me to be a Bible teacher and preacher. But he challenged me in this. If you're going to teach the Word of God, you better teach it right, brother. These two, this husband and wife teacher, were in the habit of contradicting sound doctrine. Just about every Sunday. Remember 
This morning I told you that exegesis was good Bible teaching and eisegesis was bad Bible teaching. These two had eisegesis down to a science. I mean, they were to have their contradicting sound doctrine every Sunday. One Sunday in particular, this is the, uh, there were two Sundays in a row where they did it, but the first Sunday, uh, this man is trying to teach from Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 17. This is what it says. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. So he reads that text in the class, and he, as he finishes, he looks up and he says, Yes, but the truth is that men are not trees. So this, this means you can't really tell about a man whether he's saved or lost by how he lives his life. He just sat there and contradicted the very word of God. Because that's exactly what Jesus said. You can tell a tree by its fruit. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is writing about when he's talking about doctrinal novelties, ideas, and teaching that doesn't accord with Scripture. Listen, uh, ideas and teaching, which in fact stands in contradiction to the very words of Christ. As if, if Jesus were there teaching that, he would stand up and say, Yes, Lord, but men are trees. There's always going to be somebody who takes part in church, comes to church, is involved in church, who will fit this description. There's always somebody who wants to argue the scriptures. Men and women always trying to present some new novel idea in regard to doctrine, as if they're God's special little messenger, and they've received a message that no one else has. They're, they're claiming some new word from the Lord, and... and what they do is they will dismiss the authority of Scripture every time and they'll claim that they have some higher authority that has come to them through some supernatural experience that they've had that no one can verify. Something like Joseph Smith and his golden plate from the angel moron. I mean moron. <laughs> Y'all seen these um, heavenly vacation books? You know what I'm talking about? I'm reading one of these heavenly vacation books. You know, a book where somebody has uh, is writing about how they died on the operating table, something to that effect. And while they were dead there in the hospital, the Lord Jesus gave them a royal tour of heaven. And then he sends them back to earth because they've got some new teaching that they are going to disseminate to the world. Heavenly vacations. take themselves a heavenly vacation and they receive a direct revelation from the Lord and they claim that higher authority is over that even of Scripture. So I'm reading one of these heavenly vacation books wherein the author claims that he had spent several days, not just some of them, most of them just say, oh, I was there for half an hour or an hour or two, but this guy claimed that he was in heaven for days. And it all happened uh, while he was laying in a hospital bed where his body had actually died, and his body had laid there in that hospital bed for days, mind you, but that no one actually discovered him dead in that hospital. <laughs> his dead body lies in a hospital bed for days while he's taking a heavenly tour. No one bothers to check on him. Please give me the name of that hospital so I can make sure that I never go there. <laughs> what kind of nursing staff do they got where a man can lay in his bed dead for three days and no one even notices? Well, he's still there. Close the door and walk out. Don't they have one of those things on there? Beep, beep, beep. It's like, eh, and they go and they go, hey, that ain't right. Hey, we want to check on him. People like this claim this revelation. They make their claims to supernatural experiences, but no one can ever verify. And the minute someone comes in making some claim to supernatural experience that no one can verify, and then try to take authority over Scripture, shut the door! That's wonderful. I'm glad you got to see heaven. How about going back? Yeah. There's no proof. And these false teachers will try to make their way into the church, selling whatever it is they're trying to sell to whoever's going to buy it. If you give them an ear, even for a second, just being polite, oh, you're opening the door to all sorts of nonsense. And they write their books, and they're always trying to hawk their merchandise. Why? Well, 
The Apostle Paul tells us that their motivation is uh, financial profit. Look what he says in verse 5. Supposing that gain, supposing that financial profit is godliness. They are profiteering from the gospel. I heard one preacher just recently. Oh, so good. So good. Come on. <laughs> it's a black preacher and he's preaching, man. And he says, you got these guys on TV. They're nothing but ecclesiastical pimps. I said, amen. Ecclesiastical pimps. I said, you're going to hear that again. <laughs> that was a good one. Their desire is for profit. Their desire is for profit. And then when they make a profit, they go out preaching that profit is a sign of God's blessing. It's all about profits. P-R-O-F-I-T. Profits. I don't believe that the Lord Jesus ever said, by their profits you shall know them. I think he said, you'll know them by their fruit. But there's a pattern to their activities. There's a pattern that is biblically outlined here by the Apostle Paul. And he should know. I mean, because he dealt with the Judaizers. He dealt with sorcerers and magicians, right? He dealt with demons and sorcerers. He should know what to look for in a false prophet, a false teacher, or a bad preacher. What does he say? Look again in verse 4. He said, he is proud. Knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. So, what is the first thing that you should look for when it comes to trying to spot a folk, a faker, a false prophet, or a bad preacher? Pride! Number one, pride, right off the bat. The very first attribute of a false prophet, false teacher, bad preacher is they are filled with pride. They always want to be, always have to be, the center of attention. If the conversation somewhere moves away from them, they'll move it right back. They want to be the center of attention. Look at how they respond to being praised or being criticized. They say good things about other people or do they always tear other people down while at the same time promoting themselves? Listen, I know what to look for here because I struggle with pride myself. A false teacher, a false preacher, a bad preacher, that's a proud person. And it may well be that their motivation behind their desire to be the pastor of a church or to preach or to teach is so that they can be the center of attention every week. A proud, false teacher, a bad preacher, they don't care if they have anything pertinent to say. They don't care if the church is edified and built up in faith and love. They don't care if anyone gets saved. All they want is to be the center of attention, to receive the praise, to get applause, and then collect the check and deposit it in the bank. They don't know anything of he must increase so I must decrease. They don't understand that at all. Very strong indicator of a false preacher or false prophet. Listen, when they preach the word, does it appear that they're really uh, trying to edify and teach the word or are they just up there trying to entertain folks? I don't understand that whole Christian entertainment business. We're not here to be entertained, but we're here to be edified. Amen. At the way of the Cross Cowboy Church, we had one member claim that he was called to preach. Kept asking me to let him preach. Said, I'm called to preach. I need to preach. And so one Sunday, I relented. I said, all right, I'll give you the opportunity. So that Sunday came. He brought his dog to church. Brought his dog to church and gave lessons in dog training because he was a dog trainer. And he showed the congregation all of the uh, nice tricks that his dog could do. Okay, so he did pet tricks. And he told jokes, or tried to. Never once did he ever mention Christ Jesus. She can verify. Isn't that right? Never once did he mention the name of Jesus. Never once did he give opportunity for anyone to come to Christ and be saved. He got up there and for about 30 minutes... He tried to entertain the church. And this same man decided afterwards that, that he needed to be the pastor of that church. And so he went around uh, trying to tear me down to all the members of the church because he was going to run me off and take over as they reported to me later. 
He had designs on stealing the church as if that's how God operates. Which clearly identified him as no true man of God. He was proud. All he wanted was attention. He always wanted to be the center of attention. Pride. The Apostle Paul also identifies false teachers and preachers as knowing nothing. What does he say? But he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. That means they're know-nothings. And what that means is they have no insight into the Word of God whatsoever. That when they try to preach and teach the Word of God, they are lost. Because they don't even know what's in there. They cannot even make the simplest of applications from the Word of God. You know, like you can tell a tree by its fruit, meaning that you can tell if someone's a genuine believer or not by how they live their lives. I haven't been a Christian a month or two. Well, maybe about six months, and I'm sitting in that classroom, and I can make that application. The rule when it comes to Bible interpretation is this. When the plain truth of Scripture is plainly evident, take it at its plain meaning. In other words, let the Bible speak for itself. Don't read things in the Scripture which are clearly not there. Don't try to read between the lines because the plain meaning of Scripture is plainly evident. Listen, God's not hiding anything from us. He's not trying to hide anything from anyone. God doesn't have secret societies. You understand? The Illuminati is anything but Illuminati. So when you see someone trying to make something out of Scripture, which is plainly not there, what you have is a false prophet, a false teacher, and a bad preacher. Show them the door. Then Paul says these people dote about questions and strifes of words. That means false teachers, uh, false prophets, bad preachers, they're obsessed with disputes. They're obsessed with making arguments. And always to no good end. They always want to debate and argue, but to no good end. They want to pick a fight, and they will pick a fight, and they will argue about nothing, and they'll argue about everything, and they'll take their little molehills, and they will make them into mountains, and then they'll use that as a litmus test as to whom they're going to fellowship and who they will not. More often than not, you find these men and women, they hold the most obscure and ridiculous opinions, and it's always about end time and prophecy. And the tribulation and the mark of the beast and all these things brings me to mind of a fellow I knew. His name was VJ. He had to train me when I was uh, driving truck hauling glass. By the way, if you've ever drove truck and ever hauled glass, I don't recommend it. All my scars come from hauling glass. Uh, we were both Christians, which I found to be a blessing. We had to spend a lot of time together in the cab of a truck. How many of you ever drove a team driver with someone? It's almost like being married. Right? He was charismatic. I am not. We like to listen to sermons. We listen to a lot of preaching. We would bring cassettes. That's how long ago it was. Cassettes of our favorite preachers on the trip with us. He brought people like R.W. Schambach and... Uh, Kenneth Hagin, fellows like that, you know, people who are very charismatic. I am not. I brought tapes, preachers like Adrian Rogers, Charles Stanley, John MacArthur. And he always wanted to debate and argue, you know, what the preacher was saying, what the scripture had to say. And then he was always trying to one-up me on what he thought was... Uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit or the, the fruit of the Spirit. And, but that's the way it seemed. He always seemed like he wanted to try to go one up on me on everything. So one afternoon, we're heading down to Lawton. And we're in the cab of this truck and the subject of divine healing comes up. What do you believe about divine healing? Well, I believe that God does all the healing. That men, doctors, prescribe medicines, do procedures. But without God, nobody's getting healed. Amen? Amen. He said, well, what do you do in your church when someone's sick? And I said, well, we give them the best medicine that, that we have available. We send them to a doctor, and then we start praying for them. And he said, that's not even a good Baptist answer. That's what he told me. That's not even a good Baptist answer. We're going down the road. And I will never forget what he said to me next. This is what he said, all right? 
He said, I cannot fellowship with you any longer. He said, if I fellowship with you, if I continue to fellowship with you and to try to teach you, I'm going to go backwards in my spiritual uh, growth. That's what he said. And do you know what I did when I heard that? Same thing I'm doing right now. I laughed. That was absurd. That was ridiculous. What true believer would ever attempt such spiritual arrogance if there even is such a thing? Think about that. Spiritual arrogance? The Holy Spirit doesn't make us proud or puffed up. He humbles us. Yeah. What brother in Christ would tell another brother that they couldn't fellowship with them for fear that they would go backwards in their spiritual development? Mm. This man wanted to argue about every doctrine. He wanted to argue about everything. He wanted to argue with me about every doctrinal stance that I took, not because I was wrong and he was right, but because he was always doting about questions. He always wanted to argue and debate. He thought that that's what you're supposed to do. There is no debate when it comes to the Word of God. It says what it says, and that's the end of it. Amen. I remember one time I said to my dad, I said, God said it, and I believe it, and that's it. And my dad said, God said it, and that's it. Don't matter if you believe it or not. <laughs> that's my dad. Amen. Thank you, Dad, for stretching me out. You're right. <laughs> Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about always wanting to debate. Wherefore cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputes of men of corrupt mind. Amen. Pride. Envy, strife, name-calling, being suspicious of each other, prejudging one another, coming to hateful conclusions about one another. That's where the actions and the doctrines of all these false prophets and false teachers and bad preachers lead to. Say, so, oh, I don't like going to our church anymore. All we ever got is fights and arguments and, and all everybody's up in arms against everybody else. Well, you got a bad preacher, a bad teacher, or a false prophet in there somewhere because he's the one who does it. That's what the devil does. He divides and conquers. People who, uh, Paul says that people who bring these things into the church, they have corrupt minds. The Greek word is uh, diaphero, which means defiled. They have defiled minds. It means to be con corrupt throughout. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, it describes someone who is wholly perverse in their thinking. Listen, this word diaphero is used in the Bible to describe the Antichrist as he seduces the world to idolatry. That's the word that Paul uses to describe these false prophets and bad preachers and false teachers. Diaphero, corrupt throughout. And Paul says these people are destitute of the truth. That means there's absolutely no truth in them. No truth. The problem, the problem with Christians, the problem with believers is, listen, we're too polite. And don't get me wrong, we are called to be polite and we're called to be personable. We're sharing the gospel with the world and we can't go out there and hit them with a bat and then share it with them, right? So we're called to be uh, polite, we're called to be personal. We want people to know the love of Jesus. So we're careful and that we treat all people with proper dignity and respect because they are, even though they may reject Christ, still made in the image of God. They deserve some dignity and respect. But um, the problem is, is we take our politeness to the point of putting up with a lot of nonsense and wickedness that in the church that we really should not. And what I mean is when some godless false prophet or some false teacher or, or uh, God forbid, you get a bad pastor, a bad preacher in the church, um, we put up with it because we're polite. So whenever anyone comes into this church, even people who don't claim to hold any authority, if they come in here espousing doctor, spiritual nonsense, doctrinal novelties, Contradicting even the word of Jesus Christ. Listen, we don't have to suffer with fools. We don't have to suffer with that foolishness. We don't even have to be polite. We got to quit giving the devil a break. Let him know he is wholly unwelcome in this place. I mean, you know, if the devil is out there hanging his head, oh, I just don't feel welcome in this place. I don't care. 
Don't make me feel bad. Go down the road. We don't have to suffer with that nonsense. We don't even have to be polite because too many times when we're being polite, they take it as an open door of opportunity. They believe that, they're, that we're buying what they're selling. But they're destitute of the truth. That's what the Bible says, destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain, that financial profit, that's godliness. And what does Paul, uh, what does Paul say? He says, from such withdraw thyself. That means put some distance between you and them. The church has every right to put distance between ourselves and false prophets and bad teachers and bad preachers. And we don't even have to apologize for them. The church has structure in place. We have delegated authority in here through the Word of God. When it comes to Bible teaching, when it comes to preaching the Word of God, there is one man who's authorized by the church, called by God, authorized by the church, to oversee what is preached and taught from this pulpit and in the Sunday school classrooms and in our Bible studies. That's me. That's me. And I take that job very seriously. My dad used to say, I I'm a shepherd of the flock, but I'm also a watchdog. That's exactly how I feel. And one of my duties as the pastor of this church is to ensure that everything that is taught here, everything that's preached from this platform right up here, everything that is taught in our Sunday school classrooms, everything that we hold in Bible study, adhere strictly to the Word of God. Amen. And if I hear a report of anyone teaching anything that doesn't go to the Word of God, that goes, is contrary to sound doctrine, that's contrary to the very words of Christ, you're going to hear from me. And this church is also set apart and given authorization to other men and women to teach the Bible in our Sunday school, in our Bible studies. These are the structures that we put in place here to ensure that it's the Bible and only the Bible that is taught. Doesn't matter who it is. Doesn't matter who it is. If someone comes in here and they try to usurp authority. All right, so I said all that to let you know that we have structures in place. We have delegated authority in place uh, to make sure that the Bible is taught. So it doesn't matter if someone comes in here and they try to teach something that's contrary to sound doctrine. If they have not been authorized by God and by this church, they're trying to usurp authority, you understand? And when someone comes in trying to usurp authority, remember, they're being inspired by the devil because the devil's a usurper. We don't have to put up with that nonsense. If they come in here trying to teach doctrinal no novelties, we don't have to put up with it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, from such withdrawal dies them. We don't even have to be polite when we show them the door. Someone comes in here with nonsense. I'm sorry, brother, but we don't believe that. We don't teach that. That's contrary to what the Word of God has to say. So you need to take your nonsense down the road. There's a, there's a kingdom hall down there. Go try that on them. There's a Mormon church that way. Go try it on them. They're open to that nonsense. We don't have to put up with it, folks. And we don't even have to be polite. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, doting over questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for the Apostle Paul and the wisdom which you gave him and that you gave us through him. Your word, your inspired word. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to watch over this church. Continue to watch over us. Lord, guard my heart, guard my mind, that I teach only what is in accord with your word. And I pray for all of our Sunday school teachers, all of our Bible teachers, our musicians, everyone who's engaged in ministry here, that everything that we do promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ that promotes the word of God and is true to you. This I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.